CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to The World Today, live from CGTN in London. I'm Jamie Owen. Our top stories. Health authorities urge all adults to get vaccinated as the UK reports its highest number of new COVID cases since February. Major structural problems were identified three years ago in the Miami apartment block that collapsed. More than 150 people are still missing. Turkey's President Erdogan launches construction of Istanbul's controversial new canal, but critics warn it's a mistake that will never be completed. And facing the future in Spain, where masks are no longer mandatory outdoors. Eighteen thousand two hundred and seventy people have tested positive for COVID in the UK. That's the highest number since February. A mass vaccination campaign is underway at hundreds of walk-in vaccination centres. And health experts are warning that a new so-called lambda strain of COVID may be spreading in the UK after arriving from South America. Well, our correspondent Andrew Wilson is following the story. Andrew, the spike in numbers will be causing great concern and another new variant. Yeah, so the, the rise in numbers, indeed, they are going up. We're now level with where we were back at the beginning of February, but nowhere near where the country was in January. There's still a long way to go before we get up to the 60 to 70,000 cases a day that we've seen before. But there is no doubt in most people's minds we're now in uh, what you might call the third wave. We're there, and all eyes are on how effective the vaccine is against the progress of the Delta variant and how it's cutting through the population. So the cases are increasing. Now, if you look at last week, there was a steeper incline. It's already starting to level out slightly. But even now, at this rate, by mid-July, we'll have something like 25,000 cases a day. So we look to hospitalizations and we look to serious illness and we look at deaths. And so far, those lines are still per thousand cases uh, flattening out. They haven't started to climb yet. So there is great optimism uh, that the vaccination program in the UK is doing its job and separating the population from the dire ramifications of reinfection. At the same time, of course, the Lambda virus has now shown up on our shores. It was, it was, uh, it was spotted in August 2020 in Peru, first identified there, has become significant in Argentina and Chile. In their uh, infections, it's about 30% of infections now in Chile. It's dominating infections in Peru. Six cases have been recorded coming into the UK. Now, if you compare that to the Delta virus, they have, going back and sequencing uh, the infections back in January of this year, they spotted about 500 cases, separate cases of the Delta variant arriving in different travels onto the UK shores. So it's nowhere like that kind of introduction yet. But the WHO is calling it a variant of concern and they, uh, a variant of interest, and they do want to keep looking. Now, the UK is the place where it has the most sophisticated sequencing among most countries in the world. This is where, if it gets a grip of the UK, they're going to look at it and see how infectious and how dangerous it is as a variant. Meanwhile, calls for uh, the UK Health Minister Matt Hancock to resign. His uh, affair is on the front pages of the UK newspapers for another day. Uh, is his departure becoming more likely? The phrase they like in the UK is the knives are out, isn't it, Jamie? And I think the knives are, in a way, out for Matt Hancock. He was uh, attacked quite aggressively by Dominic Cummings when he reported to the House of Commons about his estimation of how the, uh, uh, the early pandemic was dealt with. Texts have been published, which allegedly are from Boris Johnson, uh, complaining about Matt Hancock's performance. So there's no love lost between various teams within Downing Street, that's for sure. However, Boris Johnson is loath to, uh, to fire any of his ministers. Another minister, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, was also in hot water over her conduct uh, within the Home Office a few months ago. That went nowhere. And Downing Street is using the same language, the matter is closed. However, a lot of Tory MPs have taken umbrage with the fact that Matt Hancock, within a government building, was filmed in an embrace with a close colleague, 
who had formerly been a friend of his from university. Uh, he's a married minister, uh, and uh, he it was also taken on the 6th of May when the advice was for people not to be close together at all and to avoid all kinds of close physical contact. So he violated his own advice in that respect. There's an ethical uh, element to this as well. Uh, but there are concerns now that Matt Hancock simply is drawing too much fire. The newspapers have centred that, and they're ret returning to the story again and again. Should this story develop any further, I think the nation and therefore Downing Street will take another look at the uh, prospects for Mr Hancock's career. Andrew Wilson, thank you very much. In the United States, the New York Times is reporting of warnings three years ago of major structural damage at a 12-story building that collapsed in Miami. Four people are known to have died, while 159 remain missing after the building came down on Thursday as residents slept. The report said an engineer warned of cracks in foundations under a swimming pool and crumbling structures in an underground car park. The mayor of Miami-Dade County said a fire beneath the rubble was slowing the rescue efforts. We're facing very incredible difficulties with this fire. The fire has been going on uh, for a while. Uh, it's a very deep fire. It's extremely difficult to locate the source of the fire. Uh, and so they've been working around the clock, these uh, fire rescue teams, these brave men and women under, under the rubble to uh, fix this problem so they can get on. Uh, but it is uh, hampering our search efforts. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Giles Gibson, who's in Miami. Giles, what's the latest you have for us? Well, Jamie, we're about two and a half days now since the partial collapse of the building just a couple of blocks from where I'm standing uh, in the early hours of Thursday morning local time here in South Florida. Uh, but search and rescue teams are still going through the debris painstakingly, just trying to find any sort of sign of life or a, a survivor in that debris. They're using uh, dog teams and also drones to search the debris from above and then they're using uh, special cameras and also uh, special sonar devices to try and get into the rubble and, and search underneath it as well. Uh, we just heard from the local mayor of uh, Miami-Dade County about this fire that's broken out in the wreckage itself. We are actually here uh, overnight and you could still see the smoke rising out of the debris. The reason that's causing so many problems is just firstly, uh, the smoke just reduces the visibility for the search and rescue teams uh, who are trying to peer down into that debris itself. Uh, and also they're just having real trouble finding the exact source of that fire uh, and therefore they're struggling to just put it out. And lots of reports in, uh, in the newspapers. Do authorities have any further information about uh, what might have caused this collapse? Well, that report from that engineer that was taken, that took place in 2018, so three years ago, is going to be absolutely crucial as the investigation starts get going. Uh, starts to get going. This engineer finding uh, major structural damage to the concrete slab underneath uh, the swimming pool deck, also finding evidence of cracked walls and beams in the parking garage that was uh, built underneath the building. Uh, we also understand, according to these uh, reports in the New York Times and in other U.S. Uh, media outlets as well that there was actually repair work that was scheduled to start in the coming weeks but of course with this collapse that repair work uh, never took place uh, but it's really important to stress Jamie that it, it just, at this stage it's just far too early to say what might have caused this just devastating collapse. Giles Gibson in Miami thank you very much. German investigators are trying to establish a motive for a deadly knife attack in the Bavarian city of Würzburg. Three people have been killed and five seriously injured when a man began stabbing passers-by indiscriminately. The suspect, a Somali national, was arrested after the police shot at him. He'd arrived in the country in 2015. The police say he's known to have had mental health problems, but they've not ruled out links to Islamic extremism. A clear-up is underway in the Czech Republic after a tornado left five people dead and hundreds of people injured. It hit towns along the country's southern border on Thursday, destroying cars and leaving around a third of the area's homes in ruins. Rescue teams have arrived from Poland, Slovakia and Austria. 
French police have removed several hundred homeless people from tents outside Paris City Hall. About 300 migrants have camped there in protest of the government's failure to house them. Organizers of the protest say they will return if no accommodation is found. And pride parades are being held across Europe designed to celebrate the LGBTQ community. The normally peaceful and colorful event turned violent in Turkey as police fired tear gas at crowds. People were dragged and pushed by officers in riot gear as they gathered for a march that had been banned by local authorities. 20 people have been arrested. And staying in Turkey, the country's President Erdogan has launched the construction of a controversial new canal project, which, if completed, will cut through Istanbul, linking the Black Sea with the Sea of Marmara. At a ceremony, Erdogan described it as a rescue project that will save the city for future generations. But the scheme has been criticized by political and civil groups. Well, our reporter Louise Greenwood is following the story for us. Um, Louise, we've seen other major infrastructure projects given the go-ahead in Turkey in recent years, that big new airport. Why is this canal project so controversial? Well, Jamie, the Canal Istanbul project comes hot on the heels of the new Istanbul airport, which opened to passenger flights in 2019 at a cost of $12 billion. Then Istanbul's third bridge across the Bosphorus Completed in 2016, the cost of that around $3 billion. And now the ruling AK party of President Erdogan says it's to go ahead with its most contentious project so far to build a 45-kilometre canal stretching from the Black Sea in the north to the Sea of Marmara in the south, effectively cutting the western half of Istanbul into two and creating an island in the city's central European core. Now, these plans have been around for about a decade, but it's fair to say not taken particularly seriously until recent times. Even President Erdogan has previously called them his crazy project. But today he's been up at the inauguration ceremony at the city's Salisbury Air Bridge, and here's what he had to say. We see this as a project to save the future of Istanbul, alleviating shipping traffic, reducing wait times, and resolving navigational difficulties. Through this, our country will play a more active role in global commerce, with a larger percentage of transport and logistical corridors and other strategic factors. Now, the argument being that in addition to trade benefits, the canal would offer a safer alternative for oil tankers that are currently using the Bosphorus route to transport crude from the Black Sea depots to the Mediterranean. But the scheme has garnered an opposition from a range of groups, most obviously environmentalists, now, virtually every scientific and academic voice that you speak to in Turkey on this issue say that the scheme would spell disaster for the delicate marine balance in the Sea of Marmara, with consequences for sea quality, for fishing stocks, even on freshwater supplies to the city's residents itself. Secondly, there's the political fallout from this. The new mayor of Istanbul, Ekrem Imamoglu, from the opposition Republican People's Party, has gone so far to issue a 15-point plan spelling out reasons why he thinks Turks should oppose the canal, which he's described as being a murder project. And even Turkey's military, Jamie, has entered into this debate. Earlier this year, a group of retired naval admirals issued an open letter stating that the canal would undermine the 1936 Montreux Convention. That guarantees free passage to vessels in the Bosphorus and they say would also have unintended consequences for Turkey's security and its geopolitical role in the region. Well, given all of that formidable opposition and so much unhappiness clearly about this, how likely is this to go ahead? Well, in the end, this looks set to come down to money. If the canal does get approval, it could be decades before it's finished. Two years ago, the project was given a provisional price tag of $13 billion, but history if anything, has shown us that cost overruns are pretty common on big infrastructure developments in Turkey. The eventual bill could be much higher. At present, no Turkish bank has come onto the record to say it's willing to get involved. As well as the fallout over the possible environmental impact, the record fall in the value of the lira has made most of the domestic lenders run shy of long-term commitments. Now, this leaves the question open as to whether Turkey's backers in Gulf states may step in, the obvious candidate there being Qatar. But with the issue so high on the agenda for the city's 16 million citizens, Canal Istanbul could prove to be the crucial issue in the next presidential elections. At the moment, they're planned for 2023. But when they do happen, one of the AKP's top priorities will almost certainly be winning back control of Istanbul itself.
Okay, Louise Greenwood, thank you very much indeed for that. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead here on The World Today. Lockdown down under. Sydney begins two weeks of tough restrictions following a rise in COVID cases. We're in Australia. digital COVID certificate, which offers the promise of unlocking hassle-free travel around Europe this summer. In less than two weeks' time, the Czech border will also open to all EU and Serbian citizens. 4.4 million Hungarians received their first dose of COVID vaccine. 18 and over can receive a COVID-19 vaccination, but it does come with conditions. Third wave will probably take longer to emerge. This vaccination centre is part of a massive effort to try and drive down the numbers of the new variant that was first identified in India. reminder of our top stories. The UK health authorities are urging all adults to get vaccinated as the country reports its highest number of new COVID cases since February. Major structural problems were identified three years ago in the Miami apartment block that collapsed. More than 150 people are still missing. And Turkey's President Erdogan launches construction of Istanbul's controversial new canal. Critics warn it's a mistake will never see completion. For the first time in a year, people in Spain can venture outside without having to wear face masks. The relaxation of the rule follows a similar move by France last week, with Italy expected to follow suit soon. Our correspondent Rahul Pathak is in Madrid for us. Rahul, uh, despite being allowed to ditch face masks, many people still choosing to wear them. Hi, Jamie. Yeah, that's right. I'm not one of them. I'm taking mine off now after, uh, yes, well over a year, as you say. Uh, but some people, as you say, are still very uneasy about um, having them off completely, uh, mainly the elderly, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, going at the other, age of, other end of the age spectrum, uh, people with young families. I have a friend um, who's got two young kids, and he says he's going to continue to wear his mask at all times, well, whenever he can, uh, so he doesn't infect uh, his children. But as you may be noticing, people around us, right, they have masks, but a lot of people also not wearing masks. It's a very hot day today in Madrid. It's only going to get hotter over the coming weeks. And for people walking around outside, for people working outside, uh, the fact that they no longer have to wear a mask outside is a hugely welcome development for them. Here's my report. It's another step towards normality. Not since May last year have Spaniards been allowed to step outside their doors without wearing face masks. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez's cabinet met on Thursday to give it the green light. We have approved the royal decree whereby masks are no longer mandatory in certain outdoor areas. This is a tremendously important decision that I want to share with all of you and the citizens of this country, because making masks no longer mandatory in certain areas is an important measure. But especially, it will mean that masks will give way to smiles again. 
Ah, breathing fresh air outside, something that Spaniards have not been able to do since May the 21st last year. However, some experts and leaders of the various regions have questioned the timing in light of the increasing prevalence of the Delta variant here in Spain. What's more, you'll still have to wear a mask when you go inside and when you use public transport. People don't really maintain their distance, so being without a mask can be risky. I'm not too worried. I feel that people are suffering from fatigue. We can't drop our guard, but people are more relaxed now. Right now, I don't think it's totally under control, so I prefer to wear a mask. It's also good news for those working, living and travelling to the Balearic Islands. It follows the UK government's decision to place them on its green travel list from the 30th of June. So people can enjoy the beaches of Mallorca and Ibiza without worrying about face masks. The tourist reliant businesses of Mallorca hoping it will encourage the British to return. Pre-pandemic, 26% of the Balearic Islands' total tourist trade was generated by British travellers. For them, this is like their second home, and we're missing them, because after all that has happened, and bearing in mind the complicated way things are developing, we're missing them because our businesses are suffering. So in the Balearics and in Madrid, it's all smiles. The latest relaxation meaning another step in the right direction back to normality. Rahul, what's the COVID situation in Spain like now? What percentage of uh, the population has been vaccinated? Well, in one package, you heard me talk about the Delta variant. At the moment, it accounts for 4% of all cases, COVID cases in Spain. That's up three points from last week. So it's not the dominant strain right now, but experts say it very soon will be. As for the current infection rate, well, over the last seven days, Spain has averaged 51 infections per 100,000 people. That figure is just 10% of the peak infection rate, which we hit back at the end of January. Now, one major reason for this is that more people are being vaccinated. At the last count, uh, more than a third had been fully vaccinated vaccinated here in Spain and just over 50 percent have had at least one jab so the decrease in the infection rate added to the increase in vaccinations one of the major reasons why Spain has allowed people to get rid of their masks from today Rahul Pathak in Madrid thank you very much Australia's largest city Sydney has entered a strict two-week lockdown following a rise in the number of COVID cases there more than five million people have been told to stay at home to help slow the spread of the highly infectious Delta variant. Greg Navarro reports. This is one of the suburbs here in Sydney's north that was not included in that partial lockdown announced across Sydney on Friday to help stop a growing cluster of cases. The problem health officials say they're encountering is the number of daily cases being reported. In fact, 29 over the last 24 hour period, as well as the list of exposure sites, which continues to grow. That's why the Premier of New South Wales has announced the Greater Sydney region will be placed in a two-week lockdown that extends both north and south of the city proper here. And it means that people must stay in their homes, except for very few reasons, meaning they can leave, for example, for essential medical visits as well as essential shopping also. Now, all of this follows a very confusing couple of days in which parts of the city were put into lockdown. Other parts remained relatively restriction-free, and that incurred a great deal of criticism, including from the head of the Australian Medical Association, who said that all of Sydney should be placed into a lockdown to deal with this particular outbreak at the moment. Now, the problem health officials say is the Delta variant and the problems it's posing, meaning that it is spreading so rapidly. They gave an example. If one person in a household is infected, they said that most likely everybody else living in that household will also contract the virus at some point. All of Australia's states and territories have closed off their borders to Sydney, which is now considered a red zone or a hot spot. The lockdown at this point is scheduled to extend until July 9th. However, the Premier said that she will keep restrictions in place for as long as it takes to get a handle on this outbreak. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Sydney. China has welcomed a decision by Ukraine to withdraw its endorsement of a joint statement by members of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The Xinhua News Agency says Ukraine issued the retraction on its foreign ministry and Geneva mission websites. More than 40 countries signed the UNHCR statement calling on Beijing to allow the United Nations to go to the Xinjiang region and investigate allegations of torture and forced labor. China described it as interference in its internal affairs. 
Around 5,000 Afghan families have fled their homes in the city of Kunduz after days of fighting. Government forces are trying to fend off Taliban insurgents who have surrounded the city. Other residents have taken shelter in a school. Taliban fighters have briefly captured Kunduz twice in recent years. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan is facing growing criticism after he seemingly blamed the rise in sexual violence in the country on women wearing very few clothes. Protesters in Karachi are demanding an apology as well as his resignation, calling his comments unforgivable. It's the second time he's sparked controversy on this issue in as many months. The funeral has taken place of the former Philippines president, Benigno Aquino, in Manila. Family and friends helped place a silver urn with his ashes beside the tomb of his mother, former president, Tori Aquino. He died on Thursday at the age of 61 after suffering from kidney disease. The family of George Floyd say the jailing of a former police officer for his murder shows that police brutality is now being taken seriously in the United States. A court in Minneapolis sentenced Derek Chauvin to 22 and a half years, disappointing some campaigners who'd called for a longer sentence. Dan Williams reports. Assailed by the moment Derek Chauvin received his sentence for the murder of George Floyd. A sentence for count one. The court commits you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 270 months. That's 270. A total of 22 and a half years, a sentence 10 years beyond the Minnesota sentencing guidelines, but short of the 30 years prosecutors sought. With good behavior, Chauvin could be freed after serving 15 years. The former police officer was found guilty in April of second and third degree murder, as well as second degree manslaughter after he knelt on Floyd's neck for nine and a half minutes last May. The death was caught on video, sparking nationwide protests. Earlier, the court heard victim impact statements, including a video from Floyd's seven-year-old daughter, Gianna. If you could say anything to your daddy right now, what would it be? It would be, I miss you and I love you. While Philanese Floyd, George's brother, wiped away tears while delivering his impact statement. So my family and I, most of all, my niece, Gianna. My niece, Gianna, she needs closure. Derek Chauvin spoke for just a short time, he says, because of legal issues. I uh, want to give my condolences to the Floyd family. Um, there's going to be some other information in the future that would be of interest and uh, I hope things will give you some some peace of mind. Outside the court those gathered were underwhelmed with the sentence while Floyd's family also gave their reaction. We can't get George back mm. so in retrospect I feel that he should have received a life sentence as well. Right. Mm. What kind of message are you sending to our country? This brings to an end a first deeply disturbing chapter following George Floyd's tragic death. But this is unlikely to be the end of the matter, with Chauvin expected to launch an appeal, a process that could take years. There is also a separate federal case against all four former police officers at the scene, charged with violating Floyd's civil rights. While the state case against the other three police officers for aiding and abetting in Floyd's death is scheduled for March next year. But for now, after a traumatic 13 months, Derek Chauvin is again behind bars and serving his sentence. Dan Williams, CGTN, Minneapolis. The headlines again. Health authorities in the UK are urging all adults to get vaccinated as the country reports its highest number of new COVID cases since February. And that's it for The World Today. Thank you for watching. We're on smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Daily Motion, CGTN.com and on the CGTN app. Next on CGTN, it's The Agenda with Stephen Cole on electric cars. But from me, goodbye.